Within the last year, the group of terrorists known as ISIS, now the Islamic State, has grown to a militarized force. While its actions have been met by American airstrikes, the group appears to be continuing its growth and undaunted in its pursuit. Joining us now to help us understand the threat the group poses and what the appropriate response should be in both Iraq and Syria, we welcome the Monk School's Janice Stein, TVO's foreign affairs analyst. Besma Momani, professor of political science at the University of Waterloo. Eric Margulies, syndicated columnist and author, and Hussein Ibish, senior fellow at the American Task Force on Palestine, who's visiting us from Washington, D.C. We thank you for making the flight up here. No problem. We apologize to everybody. For those who weren't with us last night, we remind everybody we had a flood in the, uh, in the studio here, and so we've had to move the program up to these uh, d delicious premises here on the fourth floor just outside our offices. So thanks, everybody, for rolling with the punches here. Uh, let's start with this. Uh, we're going to show some maps. Uh, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this up. The Islamic State, formerly known as ISIS, has taken control of really quite vast swaths of land in Iraq and Syria. It is an area the size of the country of Jordan. And their ambition, as we suggest, is to establish a caliphate, an Islamic State, over 750,000 square kilometers of Iraq and Syria. Last week, we'll get some commentary on this and then get you to comment on it, Fareed Zakaria from CNN in the States said, ISIS is developing a very large, deep, and sophisticated base. It has a financial base, by some estimates making a million dollars a day. It has the ability to sell oil and wheat at a bargain. And of course, it has this extraordinary military capacity. That military capacity is morphing in the wake of American airstrikes. It's moving from an open ground strategy, taking towns, to a guerrilla strategy, hiding within towns. But all in all, if you look at that, this is the most significant terrorist organization I think we've really ever faced. Let's pick up on that last comment. Janice, do you agree with that? No, I don't. Um, I, th I think that's mischaracterizing what Islamic State is. Uh, meaning they're not a terrorist organization? Meaning that's not their principal objective. Okay. Right? I don't, of course they do engage uh, in acts of terror. Uh, but primarily those acts of terror are directed against those uh, within the territory that they control who challenge their authority. Their primary goal is to create, as you said, Steve, uh, and renew the caliphate, uh, an Islamic state in the region. They are primarily focused uh, on the region. Uh, and in that sense, I think it's a mischaracterization to describe them, first of all, as a global terror organization, and secondly, primarily as a terrorist threat. The quote is, the most significant terrorist organization I think we've ever really faced. Mm -hmm. Your view on that? Uh, I, I tend to agree with it, um, probably because I identify the we a little differently um, than Janice did, in the sense that, uh, you know, the, the, for, uh, for me at least, there's, there's some identification with the, with the people who find themselves under uh, IS control, that, I, that we is something I'm willing to identify with. And I'm, I'm willing to make the we rather broader uh, than just, let's say, people who live in the major cities in the West. Um, I, I think that if the we is the, um, not just um, the uh, international community generally, but also the people of the region and the states of the region, uh, and certainly uh, as an American, I mean, the United States is very heavily involved in the Middle East and is probably the single biggest um, regional player in the Middle East, then I think in that sense it probably is the biggest threat we've faced in the sense also uh, the threat being one that doesn't seek merely to establish a state and recreate a caliphate but to create a new kind of state and to challenge the system of states and present an alternative that is itself not just to the individual states like Syria and Iraq but to the entire system. Lots to unpack there and we will over the course of the hour. Besma, your view on that quote. Well, I mean, IS has its strengths and its weaknesses, and I think both need to be sort of considered. You know, on the one hand, it's not a state. Uh, I mean, I think that's really a misnomer. Uh, you know, it controls a wide amount of territory that's pretty low populated. It's, it's a big territory. A lot of it is desert. It really controls two or three major cities and roads in between that connect that. Uh, that needs to be put into context. It has maybe 20 to 50,000 members. Uh, that's partly if you include 
the 30,000 or so who are disaffected Sunnis, particularly of Iraq, who have now inflated those numbers, that's not a state in my opinion. So there's a lot I think there that needs to be thought of. Um, the fact that it's centralized is quite different than what we've seen from previous terrorist organizations, which in fact made it more difficult, that it was really hard to sort of know of all of the different nodes and, and parts of the system. In this particular case, because it's centralized, I think it could be defeated in a, in a much more concerted effort if, if there was the will and I think the kind of determination that can be done. So it's not, I think, the, the worst that we've seen, but you know, definitely in terms of the way it's been able to grab the headlines, the, the terror that it's put particularly in the minorities of the region, uh, clearly I think warrants a lot of attention. Eric. Uh, Steve, when I hear the greatest threat uh, since who knows what, I think this is baloney. I, it's hysteria, and it's kind of childish hysteria coming out of Washington. To me, it's the prelude to, for a U.S., British, French attack on Syria. It's pre prepping public opinion for that. Uh, the exaggerations here are absurd. You know, uh, when you look back at the history of Western colonialism in the Middle East, starting in the 1880s with the Mahdi and Khartoum and Gordon, there's always every few years there's an Islamic devil figure, a boogeyman, who's brought up to justify Western presence in the Middle East, and Gaddafi and Nasser and uh, Ahmadinejad, uh, et cetera. Uh, these guys are the latest ones. They're a bunch of, of brutal thugs, but uh, that's the Middle East. That's Iraq for you. Uh, they are not a threat to the Western world, as people are claiming. They're not going to be marching on Cleveland shortly. No, maybe not Cleveland, but I have seen some interviewed who say we can't wait to raise our flag above the White House. Well, they're big, they're still, they're big mouth teenagers. Uh, the, uh, the real threat that comes from the Islamic State is that they will undo the Western imposed colonial order on the Middle East and that their main threat is to American domination of the Middle East and to the Saudis who are the chief henchmen for the United States in perpetuating that domination. I, I, I have a very hard time with that analysis on, on multiple counts. I and mean, first of all, uh, I, I don't see any appetite. I mean, I work in Washington and I haven't seen any appetite for uh, an intervention in Syria at all. And I think if, if you uh, were to look at any uh, single thing that characterized the response to the rise of IS in Washington, it's actually how do we stop this from dragging us into Syria? How do we, how do we prevent this from creating a constituency for action in, against IS in Syria, uh, at least on the part of the government? And so uh, I think we're just operating in two separate realms here. The other is that um, I, I really don't think you can dismiss what IS has done, although Basima is right about it, it being, uh, you know, areas of direct control being confined to cities and road networks. That's true of many different forms of political control, though, in rural areas. But it is highly significant if a, uh, an organization like this uh, seizes control of Raqqa and Mosul and Tikrit and Fallujah and, and, and. Mm -hmm. These are not irrelevant places, no, but particularly it, it, not but Mosul. But it's not a country, or I should ask, I guess, is it a country yeah. in the sense that it offers services. It's it has institutions. It does. Well, it does. yes, yes, and no. Yes. It, it's a, it's a whole, I'll, I'll answer your question. Sure. It's not a state yet, but it's much too close. They're developing state-like qualities. Uh, they are providing services, particularly in education, which should really worry people. There is a, a very intensive program to create and build the citizenship of this caliphate. They know that the people who have either not fought against them or fought alongside them in Iraq and Syria have done so out of desperation and anger. And uh, particularly through brainwashing and uh, indoctrination in school systems, I think that ought to be taken very seriously. Yeah, and let me just add, I agree with what you're saying. Um, I think it's wrong to dismiss them as they are state-like yeah. in a way that other organizations were not. Why? They have a customs service, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They have border controls, and so when you cross borders... They've actually uh, erased a border. They've right. erased a border. They have police that stamp mm -hmm. uh, when fighters cross borders, so actually that's part of the way that we're, a relatively speaking, able to track uh, who goes and who doesn't. They provide educational services. They provide health clinics. Yep. So they have a whole arm entirely separate from their military mm -hmm. and from their police that they are investing in very, very heavily right now because they're, and, and this is consistent in a sense with 
the goal of establishing a state, they know that unless they deliver on services, they will not be able to take that critical next step and consolidate Beheading their services. institution. Well, they have well, done they that do too. Well, they do that too, yeah. because they, they're, but they're not the only state in the world that uses terror to rule. No, right. the Saudis just cut off 19 people's heads in the last month, including one for witchcraft, well, in this our case, ally. In this case, though, it's important because the imposition of harsh justice in, in lawless areas is actually an appeal to people who are more terrified of anarchy than they are of harsh I justice. I saw and Taliban so the court, do this. Exactly, that's precisely, that's the correct analogy is the Taliban, I Thank think. You. And uh, in this case, um, it's the, the court systems that they use and even things like consumer protection. So they're offering order in chaos. That's uh, but but so apropos of the, the point Eric made about this being, I think as you put it, the latest bogeyman that the West mm -hmm. wants to fear. For 10, 11 years, we've been worried, Besma, about Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you don't hear so much about Al-Qaeda anymore. You hear about IS now. Are they now the preeminent organization in the world that the Western powers fear? Yes, but I think that one of the things that we have to recognize about IS is, as, as well is that they op operate very differently in these two so-called territories of Syria and Iraq. And one of the things that we can't do is assume what, what you know, the, the way they govern in Raqqa, for example, of Syria is the way they operate in Mosul. You know, and I think it's really important. In Raqqa, they do use fear and terror in the local population into submission. In Mosul, they're actually using... Uh, um, a giving kind of policy where they're providing the kind of services, putting electricity back on, collecting garbage yet once again. Mm -hmm. So they fill the void of governance that's actually welcomed. And that's really important. So in even the strategy that the West has to put together, it cannot confuse them as one entity. But I have they seen have different them. strategies for I different cities. I have seen them driving through the streets with their trucks, armed men, getting out of trucks, going up to storekeepers, mm -hmm. saying, how much are you selling that for? Right. I have seen them. Yes. I've seen video of them go up to men on the streets who are walking with their wives saying, your wife is showing too much leg, you better deal with this. Right. I mean, is that what people are embracing? Do they want that? Well, I think very interesting that there is a, of course, uh, many minorities and secularists and, and uh, uh, sectarian groupings that don't follow this kind of ideology by any means. But I think in the situation where, particularly in Syria, where there was such horror under the regime, this was actually an okay thing, ultimately. In the case of Mosul, where you had, you know, unfortunately, Shia bandits come into the city and terrorize the Sunni population, where the military as well was coming in and basically shooting indiscriminately, jailing up women and children. This is all, I mean, grievances of the Sunni population of Mosul. IS came in with, I think, the kind of justice that they, they, they liked. This is not a normal situation. Syria and Iraq, we have to reiterate, is not in its normal, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not a cultural uh, affinity to anything that ISIS is doing or IS is doing. It's the reality of it's so lawless right now that unfortunately IS has been able to carve a space where they do have some authority. You know, to, to respond to your early question, see, this is the biggest threat the West face. Mm -hmm. I think one of the best ways to characterize this is if you look at what Westerners who are attracted to the Islamic State do when they arrive, right? When they were uh, joining Al-Qaeda, uh, what was really valuable about Westerners? Their passports, because that was the ticket to re-enter Europe or North America if you had a passport. That's just invaluable. It makes it very difficult for security systems to detect. Now, if you look at the people who are joining the Islamic State, what's the first thing they do? And we've seen that on television. They burn their passports. Mm -hmm. They are there to stay, to help in this enterprise of building the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. That's very, very different. In that sense, we may hear Obama, you're next on videos, but if you actually look at the behavior, that's not reflected. The first question on is that. what skill set did you bring with you? Yes, yes. To, to, build. Yes. Yes. to build. I've also yes. seen video, Hussein, of people who are trying to visit family members. Maybe mm -hmm. they live in Iraq, yeah. they wanted to go to Syria to visit family members. This is the first time in their lives they've been allowed to cross that because border. Because the border is destroyed. Because right. the border isn't there anymore. Yeah. So there is some popular support for this group. Definitely. I mean, for, for two things. One is uh, the smashing of the border. There are uh, two registers that can be popular. Number one, if it becomes easier to move across the border, for those who move back and forth and those whose families are on either side, this is a good thing. It's a net plus. Uh, in addition to which, 
there is a very strong emotional and ideological appeal to the idea, and this goes way across, way past the, uh, any kind of ideological support base for the, the core ideology of ISIS, but the idea of smashing the Sykes-Picot borders and creating new borders that are um, some Islamic or an Arab or something like that, something uh, uh, supposedly authentic and supposedly um, uh, legitimate uh, because of the, uh, the region, uh, has a certain appeal uh, that's, that's very large. Now, if you, of course, if you yoke it with this, some of this behavior, it becomes a lot less appealing to people outside of that immediate region. But the whole idea of smashing those borders is very appealing. My hunch is that may have some appeal to you, student of World War I, that you are. I hate all borders. I say death to borders. <laughs> and uh, look at the greatest example of that is the partial erasure of mm. the French German border over which millions died and today there's not even a sign when you cross yeah. the border it's it's really it's crazy but uh, Taliban wants to erase the British drawn border the Durand line mm -hmm. between Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, this is a nationalist thing let me go back to what uh, was said earlier there you were right about this uh, the uh, the area that is controlled by this ISIS ISL is relatively small. It's Sunni tribal area uh, on both sides of the border, linked by some roads. The maps make it look as big a, as India, but in fact, it's quite small. There, there's small numbers of people. The, the fighters are a bunch of ragtag guys with burp guns in pickup trucks. There's nothing sophisticated about them. The threat to the United States, maybe there will be another underwear bomber, but this is hardly an existential threat in, in a country where over 30,000 Americans are killed every year by big trucks on road accidents. Right, no, I get that, but, but you can't deny that releasing videos of two American-born journalists having their heads cut off in the most barbaric fashion has had a disproportionate influence on how people feel about the this. The Saudis right? don't uh, don't have they don't have the video when they cut heads no, off. Right. But just they on that point, that was deliberate. Right? Why did they we do it? Yes, yes of that course. was deliberate. So, and it's actually quite interesting. When did this concern that the Islamic State as a major threat develop? Hmm. After the first video was released, uh, the beheading of James Foley, yeah. and there was a point to the message there, and it was mm -hmm. Obama, stay home, yeah. don't bomb don't get involved and mm -hmm. only if you get involved will we come after you right. so it's a very very deliberate strategy mm -hmm. and in fact uh, the strategy is backfiring that's right that's the irony of it because right? america is getting well more involved. because america's outraged well, I, because people are outraged by the beheadings they're outraged by the beheadings of americans and what you see and i agree with hussein mm. you see enormous political pressure yeah. developing in the united states pushing yeah. a very reluctant president to get involved well, in, 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 in airstrikes in, in, in syria in he doesn't want to do it yeah. no that's right um you, you've got to understand i think where um the is would be coming from in making this miscalculation because pe people i think are wondering are they truly trying to provoke the United States into some miscalculation in a kind of bin Laden style of a 9-11? No. no, they're not. But I think it's important to, to explain why they might misunderstand uh, American reactions so much. The, the United States that, has, um, that they've grown up with as an organization and really uh, are a creature of the past few years is a United States that's drawing down from the region, is a United States that doesn't respond forcefully to provocations, that is always looking for a way out, that actually doesn't want to get involved in the next Middle East conflict. And so I think it's, it's understandable from their point of view uh, that they have miscalculated, uh, that this uh, sort of thing might deter Americans, that, oh my God, we'll be dragged into another quagmire, we don't want that, who cares about these remote places? I think they have not understood they're poking a lion in the eye. And and the best way doing. to drag Americans yeah. into a new conflict is by showing atrocities right. and, and right. trumpeting but them. But they don't get that. Let's remember <laughs> also that ISIS is not just a bunch of guys who came out of nowhere. A lot of them are from the members of the Ba'ath Party from Iraq. They were Saddam's men. The, uh, some, the some. Saddam's leading henchman, one of his leading henchmen, Izzat al-Duri, yeah. uh, Ibrahim al Duri is with the ISIS now. So they're playing a, a, a key role. This is a resistance. Let him finish. Let him finish. Let me finish. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure I agree with you, Janice, uh, because I've heard the view expressed by uh, militant Islamist groups in Iran and in the Middle East saying, let the Americans come. They'll break their teeth on the Arab world and they'll break their teeth on Iran. 
then we'll, we'll drive them out of the Middle East. You know, just, I think there is a miscalculation here. There's no question about it. Um, and it's ironic, as Hussein said. I, I want to cycle back to, I think it's a big mistake to treat these people as just a bunch of thugs and yeah. pickup trucks, okay. driving Toyota pickup trucks, you know, which is the problem. That's not who they are. And precisely for the reason that they have pulled in uh, military officials from Saddam's regime who are very experienced, who are good organizers. They captured relatively sophisticated U.S. equipment, which the dissolving uh, Iraqi army left behind, and they're able to integrate that, use that, and engage in fairly sophisticated military operations. So they have moved beyond uh, the, the, the image we have of a group of thugs. We have to take them far more seriously than that, but we have to understand what their purpose is and develop a strategy that fits let me, let me their purpose. Let a position right exactly in between the two of you. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. They're not a bunch of JV guys in, in pickup trucks. This, this is exactly the attitude that let them, I think, sweep so quickly throughout uh, Nineveh province and Anvar province and take over very crucial things. And the Mosul Dam, for, for goodness sake, Mosul itself is, is not a trivial place. It's a very serious place. Um, so they are to be taken seriously, clearly. On the other hand, um, the relationship that they have with the former Ba'athists, which is very significant that you raise, it's a very important point, is not, I think, necessarily that the key former Ba'athists, former Revolutionary Guards and uh, Luri and others are part of uh, the IS. They're not. Uh, most of them are associated with the GRT and the Naqshbandi army, which has made an allegiance of convenience right. with, with right. IS. Right. And, and so the question is, um, what does what do the Sunni tribes and uh, the former Abathis and others think they're doing here? Are they using IS as a vanguard to terrify Al Maliki and the Shiites into into getting a more advantageous position? Are they using them as a um, as a scarecrow and a vanguard to try to create an autonomous region in the Sunni zone similar to uh, the kind of autonomy the Kurds have? Uh, if so, there are two interesting possibilities. One is that uh, the, the, uh, the strength of the IS may be bubble-like. It may be not as strong in Iraq as we think and much stronger in Syria. The other possibility is that uh, we'll see again a monster created to do a one job and go away that has left its author on the side and of the road. who created this monster? We have to look at that because a lot of these IS guys yeah. were trained in Jordan by CIA Turkish intelligence and British and French intelligence, they're, these groups and their fellows, Al Nusra Front, for example, were armed by the Western powers. The whole uprising in Syria was a carbon copy of what was done in Libya. It is that the West is creating uh, this revolution that's, that's really caused didn't three million Western airstrikes in Syria. Can I hear best, best on this? pouring fuel onto this. Everybody like was angry at, low back at, part the, three here. at the I Assad. I think you've been watching, watching too much uh, Russian television. No, I, I disagree completely. Um, you know, ISIS and IS has its roots. In some part, we know that some of them were released from, from Assad's prisons. In fact, their origin of them were released onto uh, to counter the Ba'athists and, and, and Saddam Hussein, and, mm -hmm. and then uh, morph into a fighting army against right. the Americans. In fact, there's a great history of how Assad really cultivated this, and and then once so they were in prison. What about out of Jordan? What about out of Syria? I, you know, I think they they clearly have their roots from uh, uh, the same uh, people that were were imprisoned by the Americans. It's the same Al Qaeda. Right. Add to that, I think, foreign fighters who mm -hmm. have for their own appeal everything from the lone wolf of the 19-year-old in his basement who wants to bring uh, to life uh, video games in, in, real, in real time going to, to the situation of Syria. Add to that the ex-Bathists. Right. I mean, there's a lot of push-pull here that created IS, FSA, Free Syrian Army, who I think got disaffected from, the, from not having the weapons that mm -hmm. were promised to them, not being able to fight uh, and eventually shifting into Islamic State because it offered a real alternative to combat the it's Assad army. Russian TV. My last column was titled The Mother of All Blowback, and it was just about how the Western-financed extremist groups. Look, they came out of Syria. They were heavily armed. Where did the arms come from? Uh, who was paying them? You know, soldiers are, are not a bunch of teenagers who decide they want to become not uh, jihadi Rambos. They, are, they have to be trained soldiers who know how to fight, unless they're also fighting equally incompetent people. There is Often, a yes. structure by the IS and by yeah, the Al-Nusra. You know, I think it's a really critical point is the one Hussein made, which is where does us take 
where does hmm. this take us in the future? You know, wh where is the Islamic State going? So Cleveland. Is it, <laughs> no, I don't think that's their first We're stop. So is, the, is this the beginning of the end of Iraq right. as we know it? That is one big important question. Are we going to see at the best such a decentralized Iraq, contrary <laughs> to the history of the last 100 years, that we have an autonomous Kurdistan? Yeah an autonomous Sunni area, whatever it's called, Islamic State or something else, and an autonomous Shia southern Iraq, which is very closely linked to Iran. If we see that, that is a fundamental change at the core of the Middle East. But you have that already. It's been well, like that since no, 2004. No, 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 we don't. Not in Iraq, you don't have that. But it sounds like IS would not be satisfied with that outcome. Oh, they want more not. than that. Well, y y the interesting thing is, what's the more? Mm -hmm. They can't go further uh, against the Kurds, and they've gone. We, we've, we've just seen that movie, and we know the end of it. Mm -hmm. They actually can't go south uh, into Baghdad and south because that is the heartland of Shia resistance, and there would be a bloody, awful massacre were they to try. So the, there's, the only where to go is Syria. Mm -hmm. So that then takes us to the next stage. What kind of Syria are we talking That's about? Right. And it's there, it's even I think it's even more difficult to unpack but, but than it is in Iraq. Thread, the, the whole, it's really crucial that you ask this question because you've asked the right question and you've linked it to the future of Iraq and Syria, and what that suggests, which which I think is is the got lost in Eric's analysis a little bit, is there's a very direct connection between the rise of IS both in Iraq and in Syria in the past year and year and a half, and the policies that IS plays off of deliberately, mm -hmm. and that has also used IS as a, as a uh, boogeyman and a target, uh, the policies of al-Maliki in Iraq and the policies of al-Assad in Syria. These are, if, if you want to uh, pinpoint the greatest sources of IS strength, there is no question that it is, it is exactly the policies of Assad and the policy of Maliki, very different policies. Agreed. But both of them in their own context contributed very directly to this rise. And without mm -hmm. them, no way would you have this phenomenon. Okay, let me jump in for a second here and just we're about midway through the discussion. I want to remind everybody watching us or listening to us, uh, we had a flood uh, on the main floor of TVO, and as a result, we're not in our regular studio. We're, we're four day. floors up. Uh, we're not there either, Eric. No, we're doing the best we can. We appreciate our guests. Uh, rolling with the punches here. Normally, um, normally Hussein, you jo like to join us from Washington, D.C. Uh, that was the original Sometimes idea. Uh, from your home <laughs> via Skype, which is a lot more convenient, but you're kind enough to fly up today it's to really join a pleasure. us Thank you. as a result. So uh, that's why this program looks the way it does. Let's pick up um, Besma with this. Let's take them at their word that what they want is to reproduce, quote unquote, the caliphate. What does that mean? Oh, well. I wish I knew. Um, I think they're making it up as they go along right. uh, in some ways. I mean, you know, we want to tear a page out of, out of the 10th century uh, um, history. You know, I think what, what one of the things that they are trying to do is consolidate power. They are trying to create a so-called state. I think they're far from it. They're not a state. They're not even Islamic, in my opinion, but right. that's so the, their whole name is a misnomer. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I think one of the things that they're trying to do is trying to win the hearts and minds, as awful as it sounds, from the locals, that they can be an alternative to the dysfunctional situation of both the Assad regime and the Maliki government. And what we need to do is think about how do you unearth that narrative? How do you counter that with real progress? And I think that everyone else has really kind of approached this in a sort of a counterinsurgency method of analysis without looking at how do you change the narrative? How do you get Sunni tribes, which was the previous policy used in, in 2007 in terms of the awakening, of getting them on board, of seeing that, you know what, in your interest is to have a united Iraq. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because actually one of the things, and we all talk about what's the future of Iraq and mm -hmm. Syria, Iraq, one of the things that people don't recognize is that most of the oil wealth is still in the south. It is not even to Kurdistan's advantage financially speaking, it's still 70% dependent mm -hmm. on the central government for revenue. Now, I think Kurdistan could make a case for itself that there's a greater dream of self-determination there that, you know, surpasses the economic advantages. But for uh, Sunni Iraqis, it's mm -hmm. not to their advantage to separate. And I think that's really important. And that needs to be, I think, done constitutionally in a process that allows for not just power right. sharing in the future, but also financial sharing of the wealth of the country, which still remains in the South. So how do you get that political process together in keeping this country uh, okay. s solidified will undermine IS in the long term? Again, Eric, on this issue of what it means to recreate the caliphate, what do you understand that to mean? 
Uh, I, I see a similar, a similar call was made by, by Taliban. Mm -hmm. I keep coming back to them because I was there when Taliban was formed. And I remember their thinking vividly that uh, the, the caliphate recalls a golden age of Islam mm -hmm. when they had wise rulers, so like the golden age of Athens too, wise rulers who weren't kleptomaniacs and brutes like most of the rulers. Look at General al-Sisi in Egypt, for example, who are not like that, but who care about the people, about social welfare, and where the most, really most important thing is justice. There's no justice anywhere in the Arab world. Uh, all, you go to court, you have to resolve a dispute. It's all done through bakshish, through bribes and violence. And this is one of the things that has propelled Islamic movements in all these countries, is setting up fair and honest, if not occasionally draconian tribunals to meet out justice where there was none well, before. Sharia law, right? But Sharia Obviously. law. But well, finally, the other right question right. we have to be asked is not what are we going to do about ISIS, but why should we be doing anything about ISIS? It's their part of the world. Let them do what they want. Let them sort out their own problems there. Uh, who are we to come in as police? And who came down from the mountain and said that the U.S. Army and Air Force have to go to Iraq to keep the Shias and Sunnis Can apart? Can you speak to that? Because Tom Friedman in the New York Times today talks about how it may not be a particularly intelligent policy. Remember Obama said recently, we're still trying to come up with a strategy and a policy here. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, it, it may not be a particularly good idea to, what, how does it, what is it, ready, shoot, aim, right. as uh, George W. Bush was accused fire. of doing. <laughs> right, fire. right, right, right. Uh, so, so I think uh, that... Do, do you need to know... It, it, there's a civil war going on there right yes. now. Is it smart for the West to intervene in a civil war despite our abhorrence with what's going on there? You know, I think the generic answer to that is no, but there are big exceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's what's important to think through right now. And actually, you know, Obama has been so maligned yeah. and he's an infelicitous communicator, which is a remarkable thing to say about Obama after all the years, but he really is. He thinks out loud, and you're not allowed to do that right. when and you're president of the United States. You're just yeah. not. So he shouldn't have said, we're really still looking for a policy. We have no strategy. I mean, you, those words never yeah. escape your lips. If you're in the United States, you have to be in a deep freeze uh, before you say that kind of thing. But I think here's the challenge to recognize that it is a civil war inside two countries mm -hmm. that are where the population crosses the border and has legitimate grievances mm -hmm. against the governments that ruled them. There was brutality um, on the part of the, first there was brutality on the part of Saddam Hussein to the Shia majority for years and years and to the Kurds, replaced by brutality in the last two years under the al-Maliki government. Mm -hmm. There is no one Shia on Sunni. Yeah. Shia on Sunni. And the terrible you know, broken promises of the election. Terrible, terrible. And then in in Syria, of course, the uh, the record of al-Assad yeah. is horrific. It's horrific. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's legitimate grievances. The issue for the United States is: is there a spillover from this conflict? And I think that's where we have to be very, very careful. Is there a spillover from this conflict that is likely to come back uh, and haunt? Uh, the West and what's your best guess on that today? Yes. Well, I don't think anybody can be certain, but I think it would be foolhardy to rule it out. Firstly, I and I think secondly, it's important that Islamic State, as it evolves, and one hopes it does, because it's fragile. It's an uneasy coalition, as Basman mm -hmm. Hussein have argued, that it be contained. Uh, within its borders, because the consequences can be large. Let me read you a quote. Okay. Can I read you a sure. quote? This is from so Martin Dempsey. We're looking Dempsey. for a minimalist strategy. Mm -hmm. That's really what we're looking well, for. Well, uh, yeah, General sure. Dempsey may want to take issue with you because Martin Dempsey, the U.S. Mm -hmm. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, yeah. says this is an organization, speaking of IS, that has an apocalyptic end of days mm -hmm. strategic vision that will eventually have to be defeated. Right. Do you agree with that? I do, actually. Um, in, in everybody's interest, I do. Um, I think it's really important just to, to roll back a second and remember what was said um, in Washington a few years ago about what was happening in Syria. On the one hand, Assad was about to fall. Right. On the other hand, there were no rebels worth engaging with. There was nobody, there were no good options, so we won't do anything. There were those of us who went blue in the face, myself included, and many others who went blue in the face saying, if we don't get involved in helping to shape the nature of this conflict and the, and the character of the actors, 
others will. And it won't be to the benefit of the United States. It'll be to the benefit of others. And maybe even to, in a, some strange and elaborate long-term way to the benefit of Assad, who I think has benefited greatly from having IS be his primary opponents rather than anybody else. It's actually the one thing that makes him look, uh, you know, plausibly reasonable uh, as, a, as a figure to Is stand this what power. you had in mind when you said those statements before? Uh, yeah, actually, it, exactly what mm -hmm. I had in mind. It was precisely what I had well, in I, mind. Let me give a and, well, hold, different hold on, view on, on let me finish the thought. Okay. Just, uh, so now when people say, well, what can be done? Uh, I go back then and I say, you know, it's not like there were all these wonderful options, but there were le least bad ones and they weren't used. Mm -hmm. And this was a predictable outcome and here we are. And now the uh, same voices are telling me, don't do anything again because it won't keep getting worse. Yes, it will. Change continues to happen. The situation continues to evolve. And you can either help to make it better or help to make it worse or do nothing and take your chances. I, I really think we tried the last option enough. Well, I think, you know, after the U.S. has lost the war in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, it's, uh, it's losing ground in Yemen, it's up to its ears in Somalia, uh, it has completely uh, made a wreck of things in Libya. This is hardly a good argument for plunging into another war. Now, General Dempsey is a very smart guy, and I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm disturbed to hear him speak of apocalyptic things because he is too smart to think that the, these guys are going to get in their pickup trucks and somehow come to the U.S. And the U.S. has become like a scared spinster, scared by a mouse. Uh, these guys are, are nothing in the great scope of things. I come back to the point I made here. The guys who are really scared of the Saudis because IS is offering what in Mideast terms is better government, cleaner, fairer government. And the other thing that the, Isla the Islamist forces say that terrifies all our SOBs and oil potentates in the Middle East, and that is fair sharing of the region's wealth. And the Saudis do not like that IS at all. doesn't do no. any fair sharing of anything. There, there they is a criminal are advocating gang. that. They advocate it, but they don't practice it. Well, and look at the way they, they rule in Rafa. That, that, that is a, a criminal conspiracy. Nor, nor do they practice justice, frankly. No. When you see the kind of uh, brutal treatment that yeah. they're meeting out to women uh, in the right. villages that they've occupied, this is by no stretch of the imagination bears any relationship to Islamic justice, no. uh, first of all. So let's disabuse ourselves of that. Uh, secondly, um, what, what's really interesting is Dempsey's comments a few days ago measured against Obama's comments today, yeah. mm -hmm. in which Obama made a statement actually which is a significant departure for him. He said, we will degrade, that means to me, contain, mm -hmm. limit, yes. uh, restrict, Bum. and destroy. Yes. Right. Now, if you go on to the end destroy, there is a very large difference between any kind of military action that is designed to degrade on the one hand versus destroy on the other. And there, Dempsey is absolutely right. You cannot destroy the Islamic State. I don't believe you can do it anyway, frankly, but you certainly could not do it without a massive military investment. You could certainly drive it back into being a fringe player like it That's was a great. year and a half ago. That's yeah, the great. Can, can I put this out here at the, good enough at, for everybody. At, at the risk of, uh, well, some people are going to react badly to this, but I have heard thoughtful, intelligent people over the last few weeks read the newspapers, watch television, see what is happening over there, Besma, and say, you know what, we just got to go over there with nukes and get rid of all of it. Enough. Enough already. This is absolutely insane. What does one do about that point of view? Well, I mean, it's ironic because many of those are the same ones that said, let's go into Iraq in the first place. So it's really kind of coincidental. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, one of the things I think that uh, we need to think about in terms of a strategy is to both consider, yes, there has to be some military measure there, but I think it needs to be combined with the political. And I think that's a, a message that's coming out of Obama yeah. frequently. And I think he's right on that. I mean, if you don't begin the political process, put the pressure on Maliki, which means I think also adding the issue uh, in negotiations with Iran, because so far from what we've heard, it doesn't seem to be a part of the Iranian-American dialogue right now, and I think it needs to be, because we saw only when uh, Khamenei was able to say the very vivid tweet, ironically, that, you know, we need to move beyond the political kind of uh, um, um, stalemate that we have with the case of Maliki, did we see Maliki quit? I mean, that's really important. There is a lot of pull there that can be done by the Iranians. Okay, so you the need to get... I hear you, but the beheadings right. 
have insane. have tweaked a frustration, Absolutely. have pricked a frustration in in the Western world that this is out of control mm -hmm. and we don't seem to be able to do anything about it and this can't time, go on anymore. But at the same time, well, those same individuals want to do it all from the skies. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing is that, that when won't you... Work. No. And when you ask and you say, can you do this through just airstrikes alone, it's not enough. We know that from repeated situations. Uh, there is just no you know, way it's going to work, particularly when we're looking at the fact that IS is holding on to cities. When you have cities, you do need some a political process, right, to change the narrative and change the hearts and minds on the ground, and you need some sort of proxy party. And that's what we're seeing happening. The sad part is, and, and I think that Peshmergas are doing a good job of that, but the sad part is the other two options are horrible, which is Assad's army, and Maliki's army, yeah, which still that. remains. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that's why the difference between degrade and destroy mm. is, is very, very important. And it's discouraging, actually, to hear Obama link those two. Mm. So, uh, Meaning what? You'd be well, content you're, with degrading? To go back, yeah. yeah. That you would the, be. Yes. Well, the, I think degrading is the, is the maximal objective. Mm. I think when we hear the kind of frustration you're talking about, Steve, what we really have to say to people is, Take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. There are lots of frustrating things in the world that we cannot and should not try to fix because we make them worse. Uh, and we don't say that often enough, frankly, uh, in but, public. But people, and I saw think for, people saw a few years ago such potential for this part of the world with the awakenings. Yeah, but that and was, now but the, but it the seems completely away from that. But, well, that's right. But the awakenings in our sense were deeply domestic. Right? Mm -hmm. They did not come because somebody came in from the outside and organized them. a billion dollars spread by General Petraeus, Bakshish, well. to buy the Sunni tribes. Yeah. And, yeah. And You're it, talking about the awakening, in not, Iraq. not the Arabs. The, yeah. Yeah. the yeah. awakening. Yeah. That's a different story. Yeah. Now you can't, yeah. but there are two things that are very important to be raised here. You can't repeat the awakening because the awakening was based on the notion of partnering Just with Baghdad. And Just you're absolutely right. You, you've got to find, right, so what, what you've got to do, I mean, you, you can call it bribery if you want to. You can also call it uh, winning, winning, making friends and influencing mind. people. I mean, how does anyone gain allies and friends? That, uh, the money is a key thing in politics, and I don't think we should be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the point that you raise, which is very important, is that this cannot be uh, su successfully done relying on sectarian uh, Shiite forces in Iraq and sectarian Alawite-led forces in Syria. It's got to be local Sunni groups who uh, ha have reasons to be disaffected with the IS, as particularly beginning in Iraq and then eventually in Syria. One of the reasons that I you think hear these, be. I, think I do, will be. I do too, uh, and especially if the logic gets followed here, which is, I mean, you're right to sort of unpack. Obama's statement that way, but one of the things that's implicit in it that is not bad is the idea of a policy of phases that begins with something limited, that then gains strength, and that, that builds as it goes along. Now, if you say, I, have a, I don't have a strategy, which means um, I have no idea what I'm doing and the politics aren't there, that's one thing, and that's bad. If you say, I don't have a strategy yeah. because what it means exactly, because I'm working on it, and it will develop organically as we proceed towards a, a goal which has been described in this very loose way, that's, that's speaking. Uh, but can I, uh, let me understand Eric's position. Too much honesty, Hang on. but it's good. I, I need to understand <laughs> Eric's public. position a little better here, which is are, are you saying that this is, it may be 50,000 square kilometers of land uh, in a dangerous part of the world, but it's mostly rocky or desert, and if they want to take charge of it, who cares? We don't need to be involved. Is that your position? Our, our armed forces should not be involved in this. We're not the police we've become, but we shouldn't be the police of the Middle East. On this program, 11 years ago, I said I was the only voice who was saying, don't get involved in Iraq. The place well, is a snake pit. You're going to regret it. It's going to be panel, a disaster. Not the I could not <laughs> have been louder. I could I not have well, been more vociferous. Okay, I'm sorry. No, you you, you, you two both made symmetry. that point, perhaps okay. separately, but you both separately, made it. Yeah, but yeah. The idea that the, there's a the, symmetry the, between the, the two is wrong. The yeah. same thing today. There is a symmetry. And cautious well, voices, some who know the Middle East are saying, don't get involved. I just read a terrible statistic. The sanitized air wars in, uh, that we've waged in mm. Afghanistan and mostly in Iraq, there are 270,000 American soldiers, I'm an ex-American soldier, who have suffered grave brain damage from explosions. That's a number you never hear PTSD about. PTSD and so on, is that yeah, what you mean? Worse, worse. I mean, Actual who are physically uh. damaged, uh, so or crippled by brain damage. Mm. and. Uh, America should not get involved in this. It's no benefit. It's part of the American grand imperial strategy to rule the Middle East, what I call the American Raj. But in this day and age when America is bankrupt 
and running on borrowed money, it is of no benefit to the United Jenny, States to stay do out of so. it. No, I don't agree with that. Uh, but I think the way you get involved really matters. And I think they're really, right. I, I want to amplify just two things that Basma and Hussein said. One, I believe that the coalition that is currently supporting Islamic State will break apart, yes. and it will break apart Sorry. over the kind of brutal justice Sorry. that is being administered. Yes. How do we know this? Because we've seen it in other parts of Iraq. We've seen it in, uh, we see it in Iran where when the government was at its most brutal, people turned against it. And we even see it in Afghanistan when the Taliban engaged in some of the excesses. That will happen here too. These are not policies that the majority Sunni population, these are highly sophisticated, educated, cultured people with a deep, rich tradition. They are not going to support these kinds of policies. And their support is, without their support, there is no solution. So we should That's bomb the them? No. The second thing is that they, there will, I think that airstrikes have a role in limiting the advance mm -hmm. of the Islamic State beyond the area in which they are presently located. Sure. And would you agree that that's a worthwhile yes. goal? Yes, yes, absolutely, okay. because there are neighbors that will be, that if, if that doesn't happen, the violence will actually spread. Yeah, but can and I, I think, wait, I think, let me finish. Janice. I think that's a very, very important part. And the third point, which is what Besma made, that there will have to be forces on the ground. I agree with that, but those forces will actually be Arab forces. Yeah, Sunni Arab forces. And Sunni Arab forces. Right. So no Western forces, so the, no coalition of the no. willing. No, so the strategy the now Turks? is to buy time to allow the kind of politics inside the Sunni Arab world, which we have seen again right. and again. Now, we ha this is harder this time. It's harder because we let the Sunnis down yeah. very badly in Iraq. They, they joined in an attack against Al-Qaeda. There were promises made about joining an army and full rights and citizenship, and al-Maliki broke every promise and broke trust. Janice. Because he's a Shia? Yes. Yeah, well, we, didn't let the Sunni, we didn't let the Sunnis yes, down. What we did is we, initially after the invasion, we allied, allied ourselves with the Shia and their death squads to crush the Sunnis, Sunnis and the Ba'athists, and they remember that. But let me tell you, you want to go back to, to nice sanitary bombing from the air, no fly zone, no, no ISL zone. Uh, we, we did that in Iraq under Clinton. The result was, according to the UN, 500,000 dead Iraqi children. Uh, that no, to no me is a terrible. Like that. no well, that's what happens that. when you start bombing, no, no, but, and you no, bomb. No, no, no. You, that was you anyway, bomb that was water bombing. plants. Was right. It was daily bombing no, of but Iraq that was during not that but period. Yeah. Are, just just so I'm clear here, I don't think anybody is advocating massive no, carpet bombing of this area, not. right? Of Nobody's so saying that. Mission creep. Mission creep. Eric were right. Let me let me just say, you know he's not right, and I'll tell you why. If he were right about the direct connection between American policies. Um, towards uh, uh, Shias and Sunnis over Saddam Hussein in the year of 2003 and 2004 and before, there could never have been a Sahwa, an awakening. There could never have been uh, an, an, an anti-Al-Qaeda alliance between Sunni tribes, the Baghdad government, and the United States. It got, got broken by the ill faith of the Baghdad government, but it couldn't have been possible. There's uh, still several cards to be played here. Federalism card is a card to be played here. It's a promise that never got, that was never offered right. to, to the Sunnis in Western Iraq. It can be and it should be. You know, living in Washington, yeah. that there is an expectation that the American government is going to take the lead internationally on whatever happens there, yeah. right? And, and in the region, it's too, in the DNA. By the okay, way. so uh, it doesn't look like President Obama is desperate to get involved in another war, but right? His, uh, you his, know, it's happening. His coming to office was designed to get. America out of two right. wars. So he doesn't well, want to go back in, but... But, but there's, a, there's a crucial thing. There are two things. One is it's happening anyway, yes. right? It's just happening because he's being dragged into it uh, unwillingly, I think. Uh, by th I mean, and, and um, IS is making it very hard Easy. for him not to, not to mm -hmm. go down that road by doing things like these beheading videos. In addition to which, Remember, Obama came into office heavily criticizing the invasion of Iraq, and he was right about that. He, he was heavily criticizing the nation-building folly in Afghanistan, and he was right about that. Not necessarily the original war, but, but the nation-building project, and I think he was right about that. Praising the war on terror and, and committing to pursue terrorists like Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. which he did through drones and other controversial projects that certainly brought some famous scalps, bin Laden, al awlaki and others. Now, 
in, it is it is really possible to imagine this morphing into Obama's war. It's you know insofar as it is an offshoot of Al Qaeda, another terrorist operation, uh, and and a, an outgrowth in, in that sense, of not only something he can't avoid doing, but something that he is an outgrowth of, of a policy he endorsed from the beginning. Well, let me try this then. Less than five minutes to go here. Once Osama bin Laden yeah. was dead, mm -hmm. Al Qaeda was not what it once was. Right. And I wonder whether if anybody were to get to al-Baghdadi, who is the leader of IS, if they took him out, mm -hmm. is this organization degraded, I guess is the word you I think use. more so than al-Qaeda, only because it's so centralized. I mean, IS, its very function is to be a centralized organization. It has ministers. I mean, it's really trying to replicate. So in that sense, yes, if you could take the nucleus out, it's much easier to, I think, contend with than in the case of al-Qaeda, which actually worked on the opposite track of being a cells everywhere, almost a franchise movement, every hmm. place possible to have their own personal al-Qaeda. So yes, in that sense, it's easier. That said, that's not to say that taking out al-Baghdadi is going to be enough. That's just not, not, that's just not realistic. Let's not taking out. Let's use the word killing, killing. murdering. Killing. Let's right. use the real talk. You try, they tried that with Taliban. You know, they tried to decapitate the leader. That's a better term the Pentagon mm -hmm. likes. Uh, and uh, they failed because it is so decentralized. And I think, look, this is another manifestation of, of explosive volcanic forces in the Middle East that are venting and coming up. And if it's not ISL, it'll be somebody else the next day. The U.S. has still not resolved. The basic problem is that, that the, it controls the Arab world through uh, nasty dictators and General al-Sisi, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that so long as it does, it's going to be fighting I, I, these I fires. Say, yeah, you careful. should come visit us in Washington. Uh, you should come I've been to Washington many times. You should times, come visit us and see, and see how friendly the government and the policy community is to the CC-led government, to the new Egyptian government, and how unfriendly it is, and how, yeah. how many doubts they have. And, and compare it to the Morsi era. When, when there was policy. less doubt. Yeah, you know I'm talking, okay, I'm talking so about policy. With a couple of minutes to go, let me just let me just Can I I want to hear Janice on the issue of whether or not, to use your word, if they decapitate the head of IS, does that bring an end to no, IS? No, it doesn't. It does not bring an end because IS is fueled mm. by deep Sunni grievance. And he will be replaced by others. So the real issue is how, do, how does the United States best help, uh, first and foremost, the government of Iraq? Syria is much harder. Yeah. None of us really wrestle with that because it's so hard to address, after. Yeah, well, <laughs> to address Sunni grievance. But actually what I hear, it'd be interesting to give the last word to say, what I hear actually yeah. coming out of Washington is a shift in the last yeah. 48 to You're 72 right hours. From what to what? So originally Obama was extremely reluctant yeah. because he was unpersuaded that there was right. any good military option. And he's right to press the generals on that. But the pressure is so strong yeah. that he's being driven. And right now, as we speak, there are task forces all through official Washington working on yeah, developing right. military yeah. options for elections. Syria. Well, that too. Well, that too. Last November. minute to Hussein. Please. I think they're both right. I mean, I think there is, there is a, a groundswell, by, both in the political register and with the public, thanks to these beheading videos and others, so, to do something about this. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a threat that's being taken seriously. Political space has opened up where it's become right. possible and, and you can seriously look at it. By the way, as for uh, the decapitation thing, um, I'm not sure. I think the answer is we don't know. Because so much of what IS does is based on this pledging allegiance to this one guy, this iconic figure who emerges and talk about the caliphate. It's mythical time. It's not that the caliphs, uh, the cal uh, you know, the caliphs of the past were r rightly guided or brilliant or wonderful. They just exist in mythical time. So this guy now exists in this mythical space. And whether it would be easy to replace him or not and find another icon to fill that role, I, I think we don't know. There's always I do a think, new boogeyman I do coming think, up in the Middle I'm East. I'm not talking about boogeyman. I'm talking about people uh, who, who want to identify and join and uh, sort of pledge allegiance to IS. Who do they pledge allegiance to? It's very personalized around this iconic figure. Um, I do think uh, that there is a, a sense of um, this becoming an inevitable mission in Washington. Yeah, so for sure you're absolutely right. Well, okay, Mr. friends. Mr. Heinz gonna... Sagan and Mr. The, what, the casino mogul are making sure that we are Adelson, 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 that we're I going to go into a war. I was just about Neither to say, Eric, these people are we, important I'm sorry. we really should give our American visitor the last word here today. 
I think they're, they're not significant players. This is being driven both uh, by the policy community and especially by uh, the public opinion in the United States. And with that, we're done. I want to thank all four of you for coming up to the sure. fourth floor here at 2180 yeah. Young it's Street. It's a lot of fun here, Stephen. It's a lovely terrible place. It's, trust me, terrible it, it's not that much fun for the crew uh, who have to recreate My the whole thing. But anyway, will be in touch, yes, please. indeed. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.